Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Roxbury International Film Festival. We are so excited to have you here with us today to talk about your films, your incredible films. Uh, part of uh, the way that we curate the festival, as we were talking about before, is to really look for films that connect with one another. And we really felt like this series of films uh, really did that. And I think it, uh, you know, all of them are going to give us a really great, rich conversation about the importance of history, uh, the importance of capturing that, retelling that, um, you know, telling the story from different perspectives, understanding the, the tension uh, and the difficulty and the perseverance of slaves uh, in this country and the achievements uh, that Black people gave and made for this country. So uh, I want to start out first with talking a little bit about each of your films. So we'll get a chance to do that. And then we'll come together to talk about sort of the common themes in your film. Um, and then we'll see where that takes us. So I'd love to start uh, with you, Wanjiru, and your film, Box. So if you could tell us a little bit about it um, and, uh, and why, you, why you made it would be great. Yeah, Box yeah, is Box. a story about um, Henry Box Brown an enslaved man who mailed himself to, uh, to and um, Andrew, you're breaking up a little bit. So it's probably your internet connection. No, he told a great story, but showed a very specific style of my voice as a director. And that came out of a conversation that I had with Karen Parsons. So I don't know if she can hear something. Can't hear me. Um, I think my internet, can you hear me now? Yes, so your internet keeps going in and out. So you might yeah, need to- the, the, Yeah, it's a little, the bandwidth is a little wonky right now. <laughs> uh, um, and so Box was an idea that came out from a conversation with Karen Parsons who played Hillary on Fresh Prince. She oh. actually also tells black history stories but through animation for children. Uh, she does the Sweet Blackberry series. And so when I thought of that and I, I couldn't get the idea out of my head and I was like, what did he go through? What, are, what was his mental, you know, not just the physical um, enslavement, but the mental enslavement and what would he have to go through? And I, I dove deep and I wrote the script that night and I was just like, this is the way I want to tell this man's story. And I wanted the audience to be him. I wanted the audience to be in that box with him, to both be him and be responsible for what was happening to him. So that was where the inspiration of that film came from. I, I have to say that I, I definitely felt like I was him. I definitely felt that sense of claustrophobia and definitely felt that sense of um, intense need to be away from this horrible, horrible space and place. Um, so, I, I mean, I think you absolutely captured that. Yeah, I, I felt like, um, you know, whenever we watch films that have anything to do with freedom, uh, not just with slavery or any other time in the world, as an audience, we feel very safe and we are home and you go through experience, but you don't really live it. And what I wanted was to have somebody relive it and be responsible and be the person and be, you know, just, just have every emotion going through you. And, you know, and also part of the inspiration was, you know, chains are not just physical, they're very mental. Um, and that's what I also wanted to portray was because Henry, after he was free, he became an actor and a magician and one of his tricks was actually coming out, escaping from a box. I don't think I would ever get into a crate again. No. So there was an aspect of his journey that broke his mind as well. Wow. All right, we're gonna touch a little bit more on that and the um, mental health and the mental you know, anguish of all of that and sort of what that also connects to some of the other films that are in, in this block. So Eduardo, can you talk a little bit about your film that that followed Boxed um, and uh, and the inspiration for that it was a again an incredible way to retell our history reclaim our history and the importance of that. Well, the the thank you and 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 the film um, 
film started, it was inspired in a book by Betty Kears, which is a descendant, a uh, black descendant of James Madison. And Betty and I met at the uh, Juneteenth, 2017, I believe it was 17, 18, at um, James Madison's Montpelier, which is the, the plantation of, uh, of, of James and Dolly Madison. And uh, we, we talked, and then they knew she was working on this uh, on this book, tracing her um, heritage, and and we hit it right on. I thought she was a very intelligent person, Good person that wanted uh, to tell a very um, uh, compelling story. And when after the book was published, we discussed the the idea of doing the film, and um, and we started working on it. That was in the middle of the pandemic, pandemic because I just had finished another film in the Berkshires and we all went into, into the box. We all went into quarantine and we couldn't just leave or go anywhere. So doing that film was very challenging. So it's, it's, it's kind of like, a, uh, I'm in a COVID state of mind. So that film was kind of like a lab experience where besides the key interviews with with um, Betty Kirst in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the one with uh, Christian Kotz in Maine, in Augusta, um, which are trips that I did in my car by myself. I slept in the car, didn't get out. This was in the midst of the right. The, the big paranoia at the beginning. I mean, that, I don't want to call it paranoia. It was absolutely legitimate paranoia. But we were really worried. And um, so it was a film that was constrained by the circumstances uh, around it. And uh, what I'm fascinated about this conversation and being here with, uh, with the three of you is that I feel like we're completing, like, like there's this game called the battleship that you, you say, you know, <laughs> EX, uh, 4J, and you start sinking boats and filling little squares. I'm, I'm thrilled, for example, with the fact that uh, on the film that I was working now about ba black fiddlers, I was working with one of Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson's son. And the case of James Hemings came right, uh, <laughs> right in front of me. And uh, I think that we're starting to, to complete this. What we tell about telling a more complete story, right? Right. So if, if I'm hitting uh, a, a four and, and Anthony is, is hitting A5 and Wanderer is hitting B4, it's because we're starting to complete the story. We're starting to complete, it will never be complete. It will certainly never be complete, not in Cartesian terms, but, um, but at least we're making a, an effort in going on that direction. And that's how I feel about the other medicines. It was one more important square about um, telling the story of descendants of blacks and whites. Right, and, and, and just incredibly important. And I, I love that analogy because I feel like there are other films in this festival as well that you know can be your H5. You know what I mean? That we should be connecting all of you who are unearthing these histories. And they're the histories, you know, for Hemings and for the other Madisons that are connecting to the African stories that um, that Wanderu is telling in those histories. Like, we need to start connecting all of those and having conversations with all of us uh, to be able to, in a sense, have healing. We really need that sense of healing. We can't have that until we understand where we came from. So Anthony, let's let's jump to you uh, to talk about Hemings, to talk about yet another uh, American president. Um, and, you know, in a, in a totally different topic around food, although we did touch on that, the other Madisons with Mandy and, and being in the kitchen. And um, these themes are just really, really interesting. Uh, how they play out. So can you just talk a little bit about uh, about your film? It would be my pleasure. Thank you very much, Lisa. And I do love the uh, the picture you painted there, Eduardo. The battleship <laughs> analogy makes a lot of sense. And you're right, because um, to me, 
it was as soon as I became aware of James Hemmings a few years back, um, before I had met Chef Ashbell and started actively working on a project, I immediately wondered why I was not familiar with this man. I had heard of Sally Hemmings, but James just was uh, not, not somebody who was on my radar. And you start to hear the, the few things that we do know for sure that he did are so crucial, so important. You've got the culinary side, you have the, the social political side, the sacrifice he made by choosing to protect the American delegation in Paris when we were uh, very vulnerable as a young nation and to come back here and the complicated um, conversations that you know his story demands uh, it's just incredible that those conversations have taken so long to uh, to come up. But I agree, we are starting to get a few more hits on our battleship board. Um, there's more and more of this detailed, textured history being told in a way uh, that I hope is memorable, that I hope leaves people with takeaways um, that don't fade, and that, you know, these stories really become a part of our collective truth. So when uh, when Chef Ashbell and I met, I had already become aware of James Hemmings. And with a friend of mine, we were working on a, uh, a script. We weren't sure exactly what it was going to be, but we wanted to do a, a scripted narrative piece. And it was on the vine. It was just something we were working on in the background. And once you start diving into James Hemmings, you officially know more about him than 99.9% .9 of people, because right. there's just not, there's not a ton of history. So then my surprise, when I'm, I'm on a commercial shoot and i hear one of my crew members a friend just talking in the background blah, blah, blah. yeah my friend james hemming's society pardon me it turns out that chef ashfeld the founder of the james hemming society and i have a, uh, a mutual friend esteban granados who put us in touch i told him that i had been working on something with james and ashfeld and i um hit it off right away and i started to become very very enamored with his story and i i really think that Ash Bell, the James Hemming story via Ash Bell has its own inherent value, in my opinion. I really do believe that there's a, a spiritual connection there, and it was um, an honor to be able to tell it through his eyes and through his lens. I mean, I think for all of you, there is an incredible spiritual connection, and, and what I liked about um, sort of the box, other Madisons, and Hemmings was we had, you know, we saw this this slave who, you know, was completely enslaved, like what that really meant mentally and physically. And we moved to the other Madisons where we can actually see the story of the enslaved coming over from Africa um, and the understanding about what happened to these people. And then understanding even further how the, the, the contributions that they made to this country um, through food, through um, the way that enslaved people gave Madison and Jefferson their agency, right? So, so I mean, I'd love, want you, I would love for you to sort of talk about, um, you know, how Boxed, you know, inspired you to sort of help us understand the pain of um, and the importance of freedom and what you would do uh, and the perseverance and what, what a person would do to get to that space. And then I wanna move to the two of you to sort of talk about even like with Gandhi and with Hemings about how they used what they had to get to some sort of sense of freedom. Well, like with boxing in college, my thesis film had actually been on the Mau Mau in Kenya. Uh, who are the freedom fighters and my grandparents had been in, in the equivalent of concentration camps so you know those were always conversations you know speaking to the old warriors and just understanding that you know they took an oath and you would be killed for revealing what the oath was and there was that that type of dedication and everything but we boxed also um, about a year and a half ago a friend had actually committed suicide and he was a very well adjusted person we didn't have any idea his wife did not have any idea and that got me to thinking, you know, what, what, what do we assume freedom is? You know, he, he seemed to have everything going. He had a very successful career, a good marriage, 
but you know he had his own chains and his own demons and so for me when I sat and I thought about what do I want you know Henry's journey was only 27 hours you know that is a day and three hours and you know people are always talking oh my god I'm never anywhere on time I wish there were more hours in the day you know always talking about that or just be like oh I can't wait to get a day off I'm gonna sleep in so when I started just thinking of how we take just something as simple as a day for granted then I understood I want to use light you know I tell people there are three characters in my story there's Henry there's the box and there's the light the use of light was very deliberate to go from midday to sunset to night to dawn uh, because that was also an analogy for his journey and everything that he went through with that and so and so that's why I made a point of just making sure that you know something as simple as you take as, as you take for granted as sitting outside in the sunlight you know going to the beach, basking in the sun, you know, on vacation, you make sure you lie out in the sun. That was just something that wasn't there for him. And that's why it was very important for me to, to make sure to address it in that specific way. And the actor was also very claustrophobic. I'm claustrophobic, he's claustrophobic. So we were both a bit of a mess on set. And he drew up on that and, and just, you know, to be able to tap into a fear I didn't even know until we went to rehearsal. And I was like, are you okay? He's like, well, I'm actually claustrophobic, but I really want to play this par- character, you know? It's really heavy and meaty. And the fact that he could overcome and use his fear into such a great strength into his performance uh, was an example of that as well. Well, I think so. I think that, you know, I mean, I, I think that totally played out. And he used that to his, to, to all of our advantage to, to feel that sense. Um, and so freedom meant that much to him to be able to, to mail himself. Um, and, and, and knowing what the, what the, what, what would happen to him if he ever got caught, like every time he stopped, he wondered. So what do you, what do you, Eduardo and Anthony, think that freedom meant for, for the folks in your, in your stories? And, and did they ever feel that there was a sense of freedom uh, in the work that they were doing in, and their families in, you know, they never really had a, had a way out of slavery. Mm. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, a deep dive of a question. <laughs> it really is. You have um, three minutes. <laughs> start that clock. You know, I, I think that it's um, assumed to me that Hemings found freedom in the flow of his work. Um, I don't think that you can be as excellent at what he was doing as he was without operating in that space. But it is, um, you know, it's a, it's a complicated question because he did forego the opportunity for freedom in the more conventional sense when he came back to America with Jefferson. He did not have to do that. He could have gone to the Admiralty Court in Paris, freed himself um, and chose not to do that. And I think that the darkest point for me in the Hemings story is when he does not get a proper invitation to be the White House chef from Thomas Jefferson. That is what he wanted. I think that he did not want any caveats, um, no asterisks, just to get the full on position, the respect that the position deserves. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to be invited the way that Je- you know Jefferson would have invited a white chef. That is what he wanted. And I th- that to me is what crushes me a little bit in that story when we get to that point. And um, so I think freedom for him was an identity issue. I don't, it's, it's, it's complicated. I think that it's a, a meta issue in many ways. And Chef Ashbell, if you are there, I think you may have some thoughts on that. I see your bubble. Yeah, we're trying. I'm here. Oh, oh okay. Yes, great. Well, this, has been, this has been very, very interesting. <clears throat> James Hemings returned to America um, as a patriot. It was a patriotic act. And, um, and for me, once I just started digging and, and discovered that he hid his status in France, when he could have actually declared his freedom, but if he had, he would have ruined the whole American delegation. They would have been pariahs overnight. And to see that this, this, this enslaved man, enslaved man had the wherewithal to put his love of family and love of Virginia ahead of his own personal freedom. 
and um, and and it's a it's a perfect example of um, of how many times uh, Black Americans have put their faith in the wrong white people to do the right thing, and that's exactly what James Hemings, I believe, thought that Jefferson would do. Um, but knowing that the the valuable property, the Lexuses that some enslaved people were, um, was not something that they would let go easily because it was all tied to the economy. And when I look at Madison, um, uh, the other Madisons, James Hemings frequently actually was in the Madison kitchen. So that's a part of his, all of his, um, uh, extended knowledge that that um, just came out in the enslaved community because in the kitchen, if you were visiting, that's where you saw everything because you went to be fed there, you went to socialize there, meet uh, enslaved people from other plantations, but that very place was the heart of that coming together. And right. And those enslaved people literally took the food that was developed on plantations in Virginia, brought it to Philadelphia for the first time in an urban setting, and created fine food in America. And, we're, and we are going to talk more about that in about three minutes on the Black Chef panel that we have. But I, I wish we had more time to talk about this because that's really interesting about, you know, you don't, as, as you know, as Eduardo said, we're just making these connections and it was really interesting. And I think in, in Madison and uh, the other Madisons was, you know, we're just now being able to research this and talk about it and, um, and, and go back and enjoy our cultures and look back at Africa and, and understand the African cultures that came here, that the slaves had to hide for so many years and, and a century because you weren't allowed to bring your cultures with you. And now we're just sort of starting to look back on that in, in this generation and embrace that. And it's because of films like this, it's because you all are archeologists and your filmmakers and your researchers. And, you know, I, I, can't, I can't say that enough and thank you enough for, for doing that because these films are educational films. And there are ways that there are films that can be used in classrooms and there are films that should be. And these stories should continue to be told over and over again. As we do as Black people, we tell our stories orally. And um, oftentimes that when somebody passes away and you haven't been able to have that opportunity to do that, film is the next, for me, the next best thing to be able to do that. Um, so I hope that you all will connect, stay connected, we will keep you connected and keep those battleships on that battleship game, which I, I actually love that game, Grant. Um, <laughs> no, actually, no fun, I'm sorry. But I love that game growing up. Oh yeah, game. me too, yeah. <laughs> and I just, so, um, I, I wanna, I like just to add something I said, um, that the six degrees of separation, which I, just became about four degrees of separation. Absolutely, I agree. I agree. Totally. James Hemings in the Madison's Kitchen and so on. And and with regards to freedom, I would like to evoke the Nina Simonis to be free. And the fact that I think the question is somewhat wrong. We can't ask ourselves how they felt because we would never ever know. So it's a paradigm we can't access. But she will say, freedom is a feeling, and freedom is no fear. With that in mind, that's all I have to say about being free and what it means to be free. Uh, and that what happened. is a perfect way for us to end, unfortunately, this incredible conversation. I hope we are all back together in some other space at some time, and we just might make that happen. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. <laughs> Thank you all right. so much. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Thank you Appreciate for having you. Me. Thank it's you, a privilege. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.